Welcome to America's Auto Enthusiast Program. This is Auto World. And now, here's your host, Bob Long. Thank you very much for joining me here for another hour of Auto World. Things are a little bit different still working with some analog equipment. We uh, should have that straightened out for next week's broadcast. And uh, speaking of broadcasts, uh, every week at this time, we are very uh, blessed to have a real expert with us. Dan Watson is a certified lubrication specialist for over 25 years. He is also one of the largest AMSOIL distributors in all of North America, and Dan is going to be with us momentarily. I want to remind you that any time throughout the hour or any time throughout the week, 24-7, you can email us questions. It's bob at autoworldradio.com. For Dan, it's dan at the com, and also... Don't be a stranger. You can call us up live right now uh, here at 855-660-4261. I've been looking at a lot of YouTube stuff lately, and uh, why don't we welcome Dan Watson to the program, a distinguished oil lubrication specialist with over 25 years of experience. Dan, how you doing? I'm doing good this evening, Bob. Uh, you sound good and strong tonight. Thank you. Slowly getting getting my gusto back, but I appreciate the vote. Um, I've been looking at a lot of stuff on YouTube across the board, and I've been looking about uh, uh, looking at, at some of the work that you've done. I absolutely love your explanation about motor oil on YouTube, and I'm curious about Pennzoil's new base oil. Uh, I believe it's called Shell Helix. Yes, uh, it's quite an extraordinary oil, actually. I give them great credit for this. It's what they call a gas to liquid. Great, great thing. Remember, here in this country, we've got much more natural gas than we have liquid oil. So anytime we can see <coughs> excuse me, see a company uh, step out and decide to find another way to utilize this natural gas, boy, I'm all for that. I, I want to see technology continue to go forward. So the question comes down, is this gas to liquid or GTL product, as it's called, is it uh, better than petroleum? Is it equal to petroleum? Is it a true synthetic? Is it equal to uh, all the synthetics? Where does it fall into in this, you know, uh, family of oils, and, and can we count on it? And it actually is a, a good quality oil, equal to uh, some of the oil that we make today uh, that I don't want to get too deep in the chemistry weeds, so I'll try not to, but there's a classification of oil that, that we refer to as a hydrocrack synthetic, it's a, a, a terrific product that is made. It's what most all the oil companies, all the way from uh, Shell to Castro, Valvoline, uh, Texaco, they all use this particular product because it is a, a oil that starts out as a petroleum base and is highly, highly refined and then modified somewhat to be uh, classified as a synthetic, although it's not the synthetic that, uh, we talked about 30 years ago, which was, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but it is considered by all of the industry as a type of synthetic. And uh, so this GTL product falls into the exact same category. It's a, uh, a product made from a natural source, and uh, it's liquefied. We've had the ability since about 1905 the, these two guys, Fisher and Tropish, these two guys developed a process, and it's referred to as the Fisher Tropish product, uh, or process, I mean, where you can liquefy, uh, hydrocarbon products like natural gas, ethylene gas, and you can turn them back into a liquid, and we have the ability to do that to make diesel, to make gasoline, uh, a lot of products out of natural gas that can be made. It was never considered to be a really uh, profitable or approachable type process because 
I mean, we're talking about a process that was developed when oil cost two dollars a barrel. Okay, so yeah. it, you you got it; it's on the shelf. But what are you going to do with it when there's so much plentiful oil that's so cheap in the marketplace that there's no reason to try to develop something that would be an alternative to using uh, petroleum? So it's been there, and it is a process modified somewhat that they make this uh, uh, gas to liquid product from Shell Oil Company. I applaud them for doing it. Uh, it is a good quality base stock. Now, here's the thing for everybody to just put on their thinking cap for a minute. Um, finished products that we use in our vehicles, we use in our air compressors, we use in the transmissions of our cars, hydraulic systems, those are finished products, lubricating products that are made from some type of base stock, which is synthetic, petroleum, or this uh, gas to liquid, you're going to end up with this uh, liquid. And then you have to put certain types of additives in it to tailor it to the application that you're going to use it in. That becomes the finished product. So always when we want to look at the quality of a finished product, we have to say, well, was is the base stock good or satisfactory or excellent? Are the additives that are put in, is that additive package weak? Is it average? Is it good? Is it robust? And then we take the combination of those two things. We end up with a finished product that we can actually then evaluate for how well it performs in the application that it was designed to go into. In other words, I have automotive engine oil. That's We call it an internal combustion engine. I make oil for that. If I use that oil in an application that calls for gear lube, then I may not get the results that I want because I put additives and put a base stock together that expected to be inside this internal combustion engine, not sitting in a gearbox under heavy load with meshing gears. So that's why I make another product called gear lube. Both of those products may come from the exact same base stock, but the additives are different and the thickness or viscosity that I end up with is different. And so that's why the lubrication engineers and the chemists get together and they design what they want a lubricant to do. So now, back to this gas to liquid. I hope that it it becomes the primary source of what we call group three hydrocrack type oil because then that means all the, these billions and trillions and quadrillions of natural gas that we got has another place where it can be used effectively to meet the needs of American industry, transportation needs, all those kind of things. Now, it's like everything else. I have good, better, and best when it comes to certain types of products. Well, synthetic is no different. These synthetics would be good. They're good synthetics, okay? But there are other synthetic base stocks that are 100% man-made, which used to be the, the criteria for being a synthetic, and those also come from natural hydrocarbons. They're made from natural gas or ethylene gas, but they are reformulated by the chemist to make a finished base which has guaranteed uniform characteristics. When you refine something uh, and turn it into a product, you can only make sure that it's as good as the petroleum you refined it from. Yeah, that's so true, Dan. We'll put it in neutral when we come back. On the other side, I'm learning a lot. I'm sure you are, too. Don't go away. We'll be back with Dan Watson. Giving your radio a broadcasted tune-up. This is Auto World and your host, Bob Long. We've got our expert in the house. The hood is open on here on Auto World, and we're talking about oil, and in particular, we're talking about oil, traditional oil versus uh, oil which comes from natural gas. 
made from natural gas, GTL, and Dan Watson's been explaining that. And Dan, just to, to recap a little bit more, is, is this GTL oil, is it better than ordinary Group 3? No, it, it would perform pretty much in the same uh, classification as Group 3, but I will say this for it. Um, when you make this GTL, because you start with uh, gas, natural gas, and the process you use to the, the Fisher Tropish process, process used to liquefy it will make it actually fall into the top level of the Group 3 categories because you can't cheat. It just comes out being what it's supposed to be because today, and, and I say this with a <laughs> As old uh, Lyndon Johnson said years ago, with a heavy heart, okay? <laughs> I say this with a heavy heart, but the the Group 3 synthetic market in the United States is really taking some bad turns. There's there's some products in there that are on the very low end that, that barely would classify as real Hydrocrack Group 3 uh, synthetic. They're... Uh, partially hydrocracked, and you can't tell the difference without very expensive uh, spectrographic analysis. So nobody's going to pick up on this or catch on this with standard oil analysis, and so a lot of companies are making a product that is kind of referred to as Group 2A, which means it's glorified high-performance petroleum, and they're marketing this stuff out as, as either synthetic or synthetic blend, okay? And I just warn the customers out there right now that you, you need to only stick with the best names in the business. If you're going to pay for synthetic, get synthetic. Don't look at what appears to be the best deal you've ever seen, that you can buy some type of synthetic oil for less money than you're paying for a quality petroleum. Can't happen, can't exist, that you can't make the base stock of synthetic for the same price that you can make petroleum. So when you see synthetic that is supposed to be the real McCoy and it's priced anywhere close to petroleum, it's not the real McCoy. It's 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 the faux pas, almost got there, didn't quite make it, but let's sell it anyway. And there's not real good rules to protect the consumer in our marketplace until usually what happens is one of the name brand oil companies will end up suing one of the faux pas guys to make them produce and prove that what they're doing is real, and when they can't prove it before some type of federal uh, magistrate or judge, then they have to cease and desist, and this has happened in the past. But you would think that in this country of consumer protection that we could get some protection out of the government about this particular issue. But the government's behind the eight ball. They haven't really caught on to the fact that these guys are pretty shifty at it. And so from I tell all the listeners and all the people I talk with, hey, look, I wish, I'd hope that you'd buy Amsoil because I know it's an outstanding product. But I will tell you that if you're going to make sure you at least get some of what you're paying for, buy Mobile, buy Texaco, buy Shell, buy Valvoline, buy Chevron, uh, by castor oil, you know, pins oil. These guys are in the business and they're big companies and they're not going to try to sleaze something off. But when you see some oil that is um, got a catchy name like uh, Bear's Foot Oil or, you know, some <laughs> other name, uh, just ask yourself, who are these guys? What are they making? Now, they could be making some good stuff, but you need to go on the Internet and search around on them. And if you don't want to take the time to do that, then we'll stick with the guys that you can recognize and that you know. It's just it's just that bad. So this GTL though, it's a good addition to the to the product line of, that's going to be available. Just imagine if in this country GTL replaces most of the products that are made from uh highly refined petroleum such as a lot in the group three category. These groups that we're talking about folks are the oil company sets up these performance groups one, two, three, four, five, and six. And uh briefly uh petroleum barely refined in the chunks taken out as group one. 
Group two is really when you decided to refine it and clean it up, and it's pretty good uh, petroleum. Group three is when it is a hydrocracked, uh, another process at the plant. You can look it up online, hydrocrack or hydromization of oil. And you can get it on, you can see how it's done on the lube page. There's a couple of articles there talking about this. Anyway, um, and then you get into group four, which are the man-made synthetics that are made in by chemists, much in the same way that, you know, chemists make plastic bottles out of hydrocarbon sources of natural gas or petroleum, okay? So that's a pet, that's why they call it a petrochemical product. That's what plastic is. Well, a petrochemical process can also make synthetic base oils, which are actually engineered by the chemist to have a uh, perfect uniform molecular structure that uh, constructs, excuse me, that is a form of that petrochemical type industry. And in the United States, those uh, synthetic products that are got big names, uh, we'll just use short terms like PAOs, they're made from sources of hydrocarbons. And one of the best sources is our great quantity of natural gas. And then there's other synthetics, the ester line of synthetics, which is a tremendous, tremendous family of, of molecules. They're actually, we should love those because they're made from alcohol, and alcohol is a naturally produced product. So you could say that esters are uh, very green in the aspect that they, they're they made from natural sources. Um, so very good area. Then you get up into the group six, which is really high temperature specified things made out of like silicon bases and so forth. So this stuff's all out there, but you as a consumer just need to know that you got to be careful and not get taken for your money. Uh, guard that money pretty carefully. Spend it where it needs to be spent and don't pay for stuff that is not what you're trying to pay for. And when you take care of your car, same thing. If you're going to go to the trouble to protect your engine and the moving parts of your car the very best you can, and you're willing to pay the money to get that protection, then you should get it. You should not buy an inferior product that's masquerading as a true synthetic and is really a subpar product. And so uh, I don't want to see that happen to anybody. You know, that's one of my constant uh, uh, cry in the darkness, so to speak, to the listeners is, Guard yourself against this stuff because we're not as well protected in this area as you might think. Most people think, oh, we're protected by the consumer protection agencies. Everybody's looking out for us. No, they're not. In this particular area, they get away with calling subpar stuff synthetic. So we'll come back and talk about it a little more after the break. Very good, Dan. We'll do just that. We'll take a pit stop and then more with Dan Watson. Jay Leno, you're listening to Auto World. With the U.S. Navy before that, and uh, he knows his way around oil. He's got some great videos up on YouTube. Just put in his name. It's that easy, and it's really important for you folks to learn about a very much an ever-changing industry. Dan, I was wondering if uh, the same oil that we've been talking about, the gas-to-liquid oil, it's better from PAO. No, the Bob, that's a good question because, you know, here again, and I'll try to, as best I can, not get into highly technical stuff, but the name PAO actually uh, is the abbreviation or acronym for poly alpha olefin. Okay, now. Good Lord, what a term. And, yeah, I agree. That's why I call it PAO. So, folks, don't worry about trying to memorize the polyalpha olefin. Just recognize this. That's a product that is produced by these genius chemists, okay? They take natural gas and they use certain types of catalyst and reagents, and they make this these olefins, which are some of the same, they're long chain molecules, same kind of things you make plastic out of. So some people have nicknamed the PAO as liquid plastic, okay? Although it's not, it's, it's got different characteristics, but remember what we're doing, it's no, no uh, mystery here. We're trying to organize these hydrogen and carbon atoms into molecular compounds that will suit our purpose. That's what we're trying to do. Now, can I tell you 
Why these things end up like that, I won't even attempt to because there are a number of incredibly gifted uh, PhD chemists that make all this stuff happen. And I think those guys are uh, unsung heroes of being able in the chemical industry to make so many things out of hydrocarbons that they get out of natural gas, petroleum products. You know, it's just amazing. So these guys <clears throat> make this liquid stuff called PAO, and it is these perfect molecules. One guy described it in a, in a training class that I had that uh, these are like lubricating uh, golf balls, if you miniature golf balls. There's just millions of them, and they're perfect, and they roll perfect, and they make nice laminar flow, and they really have good film strength when you stack them together so that they keep two heavily loaded metal surfaces apart from each other because they're so perfect in bearing the load. Now, if you contrast that in your mind to regular petroleum, which are not uniform shape, it's more like a fruit salad, full of all different size things, well, it doesn't have easy laminar flow, and it it has to burst a lot of big, heavy components before you get down to enough uh, total number, let's say, of things to support the heavy load. So this is really a man-made product that's perfect. By the way, PAOs can handle maybe, in general, at least almost twice as much heat as a hydrocrack product because the PAO is such a perfect molecular structure. It has some things called double bonding. Uh, it's just a terrific product. And so that is uh, one of our key elements to make um, what we would call heavy-duty, severe-duty synthetic base stock. Now, we go up one step above that. The esters can handle higher temperature and higher lubricating loads than... The uh, the PAO. So I get in a little bit of background noise there, Bob. I know you're on trying to run the analog system, so just to let you know. Okay, thank you, Dan, for letting me know. The uh, the thing is, folks, that you're not thinking about the chemistry particularly, but that's why you find the the PAOs up in the group four category because they are superior to anything in group three. And group three is where you find the GTL and the Hydrocrack products. And then these wonderful esters would be all the way up in group five. So, But there are reasons why when you formulate motor oil that you may not want to use all esters or all PAOs. So what they do over at the Anvil company is they have a uh, blend of PAO and esters in the uh, premium products such as the Signature Series. So this stuff all gets into the weeds. It's too deep. But what I, I want the customer, the, the the folks out there listening, the listener to understand is, is that there's real cool stuff going on by these chemists and how they make this stuff. And it's to your advantage that they're competing on trying to make better products. And so – you have every right to expect to get the superior technology when you pay the money for it. And just guard yourself. Don't let the, the fraudulent ones come in and sell you something that is not what you're expecting to get. I, I just, you know, I am a, uh, as they would call it, a true believer in sy synthetic lubricants. And the thing that can undermine synthetics is when the, the uh, hucksters start selling subpar stuff, calling it synthetic, and then start to give us a bad name. And uh, that irks me. I don't want any of you to fall into that situation. I want you to buy the stuff that you expect to get the performance, and you get the performance, and you're happy you did it, and it was money well spent. I just don't want you to get taken by these guys, which brings me to one other topic in this area before we leave it, and that's when you see products that are marketed as a, a blend, a synthetic blend, okay? Mm -hmm. Be careful because there is no requirement in any government standard for how much synthetic you have to have in a product for it to qualify to be called a synthetic blend. So you could have 5% synthetic in it and the rest of it be petroleum, and they could be calling it a synthetic blend, okay? So, 
unless you can verify and get something that's either posted in writing on the Internet or somewhere that says that our synthetic blend contains 50% synthetic and 50% petroleum, something like that, whatever it says, but then you might have in writing where somebody's willing to say something. I challenge you to find that because I have worked hard at trying to find statements from the companies that sell these products of just how much synthetic is in this. Can't give an answer. They don't want to give an answer. Nobody's going to give an answer. If you had the choice of putting in something that cost you, just given numbers, um, $2 a quart versus something that cost you $0.50 cents a quart into the mix that you were going to turn around and sell, you'd be pretty motivated to use as much of the $0.50 cents a quart as you could in order to make the most profit on the other end. So the the whole blend-type um, family of oils, they're just so open to misrepresentation and fraud. I'm not accusing anybody of fraud or misrepresentation, but I can tell you that you don't know when you buy a quart of a synthetic blend what you're getting. You don't know what is there and how much of it's supposed to be. And what if your synthetic constituent in this oil happens to be the glorified petroleum group 2A and you didn't even make it to the low end of the group 3 hydrocrack synthetic and that's your portion which is supposedly synthetic in your synthetic blend. That means you got nothing but stuff that's equivalent to petroleum but you're paying twice the money for it. So I don't want to make you leery of trying certain products but I want to make you understand that you have to be cautious and you have to guard yourself against being taken by these things. Um, my personal, personal opinion is I have no use at all for something called a synthetic blend. If I think it's important enough to put some synthetic in it to improve the performance of the product, why wouldn't I go all the way and put enough synthetic in it to call it a full synthetic? So, yeah, absolutely. I just don't understand the process. We're going to have more with Dan Watson. As Auto World continues on great radio stations and all those listeners around the world at GCNlive.com. Give us a call, shoot us an email. Thank you. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Giving your radio a broadcasted tune-up. This is Auto World and your host, Bob Long. Dan Watson is doing our guest at this hour in the broadcast. He's one of our regular contributors, an expert in lubrication, and especially an expert in the realm of synthetics. He's one of the largest Sam's Oil dealers in all of the United States and Canada, and he's here to help you. So don't be a stranger. You can call us at 855 660 Four two six one eight five five six six zero four two six one. And during this hour, we've been talking about GTL, which is gas to oil, and talking about uh, Group Three motor oils as well as PAO motor oils. Um, you have a, a suggestion for folks uh, uh, to, to put uh, the word better in their search when looking on YouTube or just in, in asking professionals for, for their guidance. Of course, they should be coming to you for your knowledge and expertise, but uh, uh, this stuff can, like you say, get pretty into the weeds. Yes, it can. And, you know, Bob, that's, that's uh, in general what, uh, you know, I'm a uh, Sometimes I feel like I'm a, you know, the mass crusader, you know, <laughs> crusading dude. And then my wife would claim, no, I'm more like Don Quixote. I'm just, uh, you know, trying to uh, do the windmills, you know, just the windmills. Because here's the thing. This is big business. And to all of our listeners out there, uh, business is business. But as much as we'd like to think that everybody – is going to follow the model of giving you uh, always what is best for the consumer. It's just not true. And there's always going to be in any company a certain amount of, that you've got to 
promote your product and try to stay in business. But there's always that category, which is to uh, ride on name recognition of something and produce something which is a, uh, I'll just call it faux pas. It looks the same, but it isn't the same. Mm -hmm. Get that cheaper product out there and ride on that bow wave of interest and make a ton of money before people realize that you weren't actually selling what they're looking for. You were just pretending. Now, that's going to happen. It happens in every kind of new technology and product that comes out. What irks me is I don't want to see that give a a bloody nose to the synthetic industry. It is so bad at this point right now that some of the people high up in the industry and experts are saying that we will have to have a different technical name for true synthetics uh, Mm -hmm. in the near future because so much imposter stuff has pushed in and got away with it that just saying that you want to buy a synthetic no longer qualifies as it used to because that may get you what something that you weren't expecting to get. It's sort of like when radial tires came into the marketplace and they began to accelerate in the marketplace. Well, there was a few times and some guys got busted of making some bias by tires and labeling them as, uh, you know, radial tires and trying to sell them, or they made some bias tires and said just as good as uh, any uh, radial, which it wasn't, and they made a lot of money through a transition period of doing that until it just became untenable that nobody would believe them anymore, and it it faded out of the, the industry. Well, you know, tires are one thing, but when you start using substandard lubrication and cost people engines and transmissions and gear sets, that's that's a pretty expensive um, transition to take the time to where people finally recognize that, well, you just, you can you can call that product anything you want, but it's not that good and they leave you alone. And this is why you muddy the waters with the fact that you allow people to call stuff synthetic or a synthetic blend, and they're just using that synthetic terminology because, Bob, in all of the the surveys run now by the people that do that sort of thing, they find that uh, synthetic is related to quality by over 90% of the people that hear the term. So if you're out there with a a Junko product and you want to try to sell as much of it as you can, you try to jump on the bandwagon that people recognize synthetic as meaning high quality, and you call your product synthetic or you call it uh, synthetic blend or whatever you want to call it, Because you're counting on the fact that that labeling it with the term synthetic will buy you a lot of customers that wouldn't have come to you if it wasn't on the bottle. And so unless we get better protection by the government to sort that out and to really bust some of these guys for for doing this kind of stuff, uh, it's up to the consumer to be weary. And that's that term you know from economics, laissez-faire, buyer beware. Okay, and that's the market we're in, and that's why I'm trying to tell people this stuff, okay? I don't want to um, bloody the uh, the face of the industry of, of, of you know, lubrication because there's very good companies out there. But that's what I'm telling you to do is stay with the companies that you can trust. Be real leery of, of bouncing off into some of these guys that have a deal that's just too good to be true because it's too good to be true and <laughs> probably not true. So be careful, yep. which brings me to one other thing to look for. There's terminology that's being used again, which gets very deceptive. I have on bottles where it will say synthetic, Mm -hmm. it will say synthetic blend, it will say full synthetic, and then once in a while you see something that says 100% synthetic. Mm -hmm. What does all that stuff mean? What are they trying to tell you? Well, here's the point, really, because the marketing people do have a little bit of control over this. If you have a product that says it's synthetic, It's not supposed to have um, any amount of petroleum in it. It's supposed to be synthetic. But, see, when we put additives into a product, we have to have a carrier oil. And carrier oil is what you mix the additives in, and then you pour that into the base stock, and everything gets mixed up. Well, the carrier oil in a lot of products, because carrier oils come from – they're mixed over the chemical company. They'll just mix them in some – petroleum base, some 30-weight 
petroleum, let's say. Mm-hmm. And then you mix that into your Group 3 base stock, and you may have a percentage of synthetic uh, still, and you may have the additives may make up 25%. The additive uh, combination may make up 25% of the oil. So you got 75% synthetic <laughs> and 25% petroleum. And they label that as a full synthetic, okay, mm-hmm. because the base stock was full synthetic. They don't talk about the carrier oil, but it can be up to 25%. In some cases, real poor oil, it can be 35%. Oh, wow. Talk okay. about tricky. Yeah. yeah, so now you see these things when, they, when they're labeled as full synthetic, you have to recognize that that means that the base stock was all synthetic, but it doesn't take into consideration the carrier oil for the additive package. Now, if you see that bottle labeled 100% synthetic, by law, and I mean they enforce it, even the additive packages must be mixed in the equal comparable synthetic as the base stock. Then it can be labeled as 100%. I bring this up because I challenge anybody to look at oil on the auto parts shelf or hardware store, wherever they're looking at the oil, and try to find that 100% synthetic. You won't find it, and you're going to find it on such products as Amsoil products, all of them, both our what we call our OE line, our XL line, and our premium signature series line, it says right on the bottle, 100% synthetic. Mm -hmm. And I had a little something to do with that a few years back because Amsoil was labeling their products, and they were using 100% synthetic, but they didn't really, you know, take that heavy an interest to have to label on that. And I, I really worked hard influenced the company to tell them, look, there's people out here who are just not anywhere close, and they are really deceptive. You make yeah. 100% synthetic product, put it on the label. And yeah, so exactly. you're seeing it now all over the Amsoil products because they make 100% synthetic product. If you're going to buy synthetic engine oil or transmission fluid or gear oil or motorcycle oil, then you look for something that is 100% synthetic where you can find it, okay? There's a couple of products that Amazon makes that won't say 100%, and the reason is because the the additive package that it comes in is a pre-made additive package that's, that's certified by an outside chemical company, and so that product may have, and in Amazon, they don't you don't have to have as much of that, so they'll run maybe uh, 10% or 15% in that carrier oil category. Those are there, but they're not labeled 100%. Mm-hmm. If you look at Amsoil's uh, motor oils that are that are the premium products, 100% synthetic. Wow. Well, I've learned a lot from our good friend Dan Wants at thelubepage.com. You can send him a note there. And what's the best telephone number for you, Dan? Uh, the 800-370-2986. Thank you, my friend. We'll talk to you again next All right, week. Well, next week. See you there. Folks, this is Bob Long, host of Auto World Radio, with great news. We have a new sponsor, Dan Watson, who distributes Amsoil throughout the USA and Canada. Dan is one of Amsoil's largest distributors. He's a former U.S. Navy nuclear specialist and a certified lubrication specialist with 25-plus years of experience. You can listen to Dan every Sunday evening live at 6 p.m. Eastern Time here on GCNlive.com. Get all of your questions answered and ensure you get the best lubrication for your car, truck, boat, or really anything that moves. In 1972, Amsoil pioneered synthetic lubrication, and Amsoil continues to provide the best lubrication money can buy. Get the best advice for the best results. Contact Dan at thelubepage.com. That's thelubepage.com. Or call 800-370-2986. That's 800-370-2986.